I'm going to read just a few paragraphs um, from the first chapter of my novel. And for those of you who don't know what it's about, um, it's about picture brides. Um, it's a very common first generation story. Thousands of people's grandmothers came over from Japan to this country as picture brides. And they had exchanged letters and photographs um, with their future husbands who were uh, Japanese male laborers who come over earlier in the century, the early 1900s, to work. Uh, on the West Coast. Uh, so the first chapter, well, the entire novel is, is told in what I call the we voice, the first person plural. So there's no main character. So it's about 100 plus young brides uh, <coughs> who came over from Japan. And these were very young girls. Some of them were 13, 14, 15 years old, often from very, very um, poor rural villages. And the first chapter is called Come Japanese. And it's set uh, in the steerage compartment of a ship that's bringing over uh, these young brides. Um, and it's probably around 1918, 1919. Come Japanese. On the boat, we were mostly virgins. We had long black hair and flat white feet, and we were not very tall. Some of us had eaten nothing but rice gruel as young girls and had slightly bowed legs. And some of us were only 14 years old and were still young girls ourselves. Some of us came from the city and wore stylish city clothes, but many more of us came from the country and on the boat we wore the same old kimonos we'd been wearing for years, faded hand-me-downs from our sisters that had been patched and re-dyed many times. Some of us came from the mountains and had never before seen the sea, except for in pictures. And some of us were the daughters of fishermen who had been around the sea all our lives. Perhaps we had lost a brother or father to the sea, or a fiance, or perhaps someone we loved had jumped into the water one unhappy morning and simply swum away. And now it was time for us, too, to move on. On the boat, the first thing we did, before deciding who we liked and didn't like, before telling each other which one of the islands we were from and why we were leaving, before even bothering to learn each other's names, was compare photographs of our husbands. They were handsome young men with dark eyes and full heads of hair and skin that was smooth and unblemished. Their chins were strong, their posture good, their noses were straight and high. They looked like our brothers and fathers back home, only better dressed in gray frock coats and fine western three-piece suits. Some of them were standing on sidewalks in front of wooden A-frame houses with white picket fences and neatly mowed lawns, and some were leaning in driveways against Model T Fords. Some were sitting in studios on stiff high back chairs with their hands neatly folded and staring straight into the camera as though they were ready to take on the world. All of them had promised to be there waiting for us in San Francisco when we sailed into port. On the boat, we often stood on the deck for hours with the wind in our hair watching the other passengers go by. We saw turbaned Sikhs from the Punjab who were fleeing to Panama from their native land. We saw wealthy white Russians who were fleeing the revolution. We saw Chinese laborers from Hong Kong who were going to work in the cotton fields of Peru. We saw King Lee Ivanovich and his famous band of gypsies who owned a large cattle ranch in Mexico and were rumored to be the richest band of gypsies in the world. We saw a trio of sunburned German tourists and a handsome Spanish priest and a tall, ruddy Englishman named Charles who appeared at the railing every afternoon at quarter past three and walked several brisk lengths of the deck. Charles was traveling in first class and had dark green eyes and a sharp pointy nose and spoke perfect Japanese and was the first white person many of us had ever seen. He was a professor of foreign languages 
at the university in Osaka and had a Japanese wife and a child and had been to America many times and was endlessly patient with our questions. Was it true that Americans had a strong animal odor? Charles laughed and said, well, do I? And let us lean in close for a sniff. <laughs> and just how hairy were they? About as hairy as I am, Charles replied. And then he rolled up his sleeves to show us his arms, which were covered with dark brown hairs that made us shiver. And did they really grow hair on their chests? Charles blushed and said he could not show us his chest, and we blushed and explained that we had not asked him to. <laughs> and were there still savage tribes of red Indians wandering all over the prairies? Charles told us that all the red Indians had been taken away, and we breathed a sigh of relief. And was it true that the women in America did not have to kneel down before their husbands or cover their mouths when they laughed. Charles stared at a passing ship on the horizon and then sighed and said, sadly, yes. <laughs> and did the men and women really dance cheek to cheek all night long? Only on Saturdays, Charles explained. And were the dance steps very difficult? Charles said they were easy and gave us a moonlit lesson on the foxtrot the following evening on the deck. Slow, slow, quick, quick. And was downtown San Francisco truly bigger than the Ginza? Why, of course. And were the houses in America really three times the size of our own? Indeed, they were. And did each house have a piano in the front parlor? Charles said it was more like every other house. And did he think we would be happy there? Charles took off his glasses and looked down at us with his lovely green eyes and said, oh yes, very. On the boat, we could not have known that when we first saw our husbands, we would have no idea who they were. That the crowd of men in knit caps and shabby black coats waiting for us down below on the dock would bear no resemblance to the handsome young men in the photographs. That the photographs we have been sent were 20 years old. That the letters we have been written have been written to us by people other than our husbands, professional people with beautiful handwriting whose job it was to tell lies and win hearts. That when we first heard our names being called out across the water, one of us would cover her eyes and turn away. I want to go home. But the rest of us would lower our heads and smooth down the skirts of our kimonos and walk down the gangplank and step out into the still warm day. This is America, we would say to ourselves. There is no need to worry. And we would be wrong.